I wonder if you're like me. I bet you are. Let's check it out and see. When we're young in our art careers and practices, we have the tendency to get ahead of ourselves. If you're like me, you might have thought or said things like, I will have a major show right out of art school. All of my work will be snatched off the walls and shelves as soon as it's finished. And ideas and the ability to execute them will always be easy. And I will always be prolific day in and day out. Does this sound like you? I know that it did for me when I was just getting started. But as I began to get out there and develop my professional practices, I'd head into my projects all gung-ho, only to quickly find myself stuck, no traction, lost, and frustrated. But this confused me because I knew that I had so many good ideas that I wanted to put out into the world. I often felt stuck. I wanted to communicate with the rest of the world, but then I would just stall out or come up against some overwhelming chasms. I began to refer to these chasms as the three gaps of creativity. Have you ever heard the old saying, their eyes are bigger than their stomach? Sometimes people use this expression to describe someone who loads up their plate with a ton of yummy food and they're so excited to eat it all because it's so delicious. But once they begin to indulge, they realize that their belly fills up much more quickly than their eyes stop oogling over the yumminess. Now, when you're new to the scene, full of energy and enthusiasm, sometimes your ideas are bigger than your ability to execute them. Now, I know it's a bummer to come to this conclusion, but that's okay. It's all part of the experience of becoming a pro at your craft and your business. Now, my artist clients are often surprised by the gaps that exist between how their idea feels in their mind and how it feels when they try to make the idea work outside of themselves. Now, since I'm also an artist, I totally understand the amazing feeling that happens when a good idea really gels in our hearts and minds. Author Scott Birkin says this, good ideas often come with a wave of euphoria, a literal dopamine high, and we're joyously overwhelmed by it. It's natural in that instance to overlook the dozens of questions that must be answered to bring the idea to life. We easily postpone those questioning thoughts, believing that if we can come up with the big idea, surely we can conquer all the little problems too. An epiphany is a powerful experience, but the myth of the epiphany is that it alone is all you need, right? That makes sense. Isn't it so frustrating that when you do sit down to work on the details of an idea, the euphoria fades away? The actual work of thinking about how to bring the idea into the world was less fun than fantasizing about the idea's realization. It might take an hour or a day to do, but soon the tasks necessary for bringing your idea to fruition really feel boring. Even though your elevator pitch is spot on, it doesn't negate the effort required to complete all of the sketches, drafts, and models required to flesh out your idea in its final form. What I'm talking about right now is the effort gap. Now take this in, no matter how great your idea is, there is always energy that you have to spend and put in, often on relatively boring work to deliver your baby to the world. Again, you always need to expend energy to put in effort in order to get the results that you want. Amazing works of art, everybody, don't just magically appear out of thin air somewhere. An artist just like you is daydreaming, imagining, planning, sketching, reading, writing, erasing, painting over, sanding down, starting over, trying out multiple solutions. Woo, you get the idea. The normal reaction to the realization that your amazing idea has led to ordinary work is to retreat, to back away, to ignore it.
You feel you're doing something wrong if delivering on the idea isn't as exciting as finding the idea itself. Somehow, you believe the feeling of euphoria should remain throughout the entire project, and when it doesn't, you got to choose to put in effort, and you assume something is amiss. I mean, Hollywood often skips from the discovery of the idea to fame and fortune, but in the real life, you have to choose to close that distance yourself. Okay, so brace yourself. This might sting a little bit, but I promise I really do love you. Okay, hold on. Now, if you're honest with yourself, maybe you just don't want to work that hard. Okay, how did that feel? A little stingy, a little judgmental, right? I know because I'm also talking to myself. <laughs> Sometimes I don't want to work that hard, but let's face it, it's true. Sometimes you really don't want to put in the effort to reap the benefits that come along with the compelling and successful project. You just want the benefits, not the dirty hands or the sweaty brow. Like me, I bet you'd prefer to return to the excitement of thinking up more ideas rather than doing anything about them. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with this, but the problem shows up when you beat yourself up by denying the fact that you have less ambition than you wish you had. Maybe you're like so many other people who suffer from creative cold feet and a fear of commitment. Now, I know that I have, and you and I, well, if you haven't guessed, we're not that different from one another. Sometimes you're afraid to close the effort gap. You want to be creative, but without taking any risks. You know, there is a chance that you can put in a lot of time and effort only to see your project fail on the other side. So, Instead of risking that, you prefer to keep the idea locked inside your mind. <laughs> yeah. Now, here's where it gets a bit ridiculous. It gets ridiculous when someone else produces something with a similar idea, and then you claim false possession, exclaiming, I thought of that years ago. How dare they take my idea? But guess what? The only way to possess an idea is to close the effort gap and actually put something out into the world. Actually do something. As it turns out, coming up with the idea is the easy part. Let me tell you a story. Recently, I felt stuck. Now, this wasn't paralyzed by self-doubt stuck or even exhausted stuck. Although sometimes those are reasons why I get stuck. But this time, I felt stuck in a whirlwind because there were too many potential steps to choose from. I was left overwhelmed and unsure where to begin. Last year, I invested a ton of time and energy into a series of paintings that, as it turns out, I didn't really want to do. However, I've recently called... Uh, felt, rather, called to revisit some of the paintings that I was so excited about and begin reworking them. With a bunch of the paintings already started, I made a commitment to finish them by the end of the month. Now, this felt ambitious, but doable. Kind of an overachiever that way. But a few days in, the initial momentum, the euphoria of the idea, I felt stalled. And at the beginning of the week, I went to my studio and pulled out the in-progress work and even made a few moves on each of them. And I stepped back from them and considered what the next moves needed to be to get them to the next stage of their journey. But every time I began to get a hold of what move on the canvas would be next, I felt too paralyzed to take any action at all. Anything I did felt too permanent, irreversible, and eventually a week and then two passed with little progress happening on the paintings. Now, it's times like these where being willing to take imperfect action is so important. First, we want to focus on the process, not the destination. For just a little bit, 
put the need to have it done out of your head and focus just on the process. Remember, you like making your art, right? Now, in this particular situation, going back to my story, I had become so consumed with getting these paintings finished, it fed my instinct toward perfectionism, or the temptation to wait for everything to be just right and to be fully certain about all of my next steps before taking any of them. Sometimes I, and again, because we're not that dissimilar you, need to remember that we aren't making our art for the glory of checking things off our to-do lists. I'm creating art for the joy of creating, for the hope that it helps people connect with themselves and the world around them more fully. How about you? What are you really creating for? What is your purpose? Just take one step. One key question to ask yourself when you're in this kind of frozen position is what's one next step that I can take? Just taking that first step, however small it might be, has the ability to take you out of that sense of being overwhelmed. You might not finish, you might not get the damn thing done, but at least you've taken a step. You see, once you start, the next step becomes more clear. And this reminds me of Glennon Doyle's mantra in her memoir, Love Warrior. She says, all I have to do is the next right thing. Once I let go of creating a perfect action plan and reminded myself to enjoy the process, I realized that my next step was clear. I realized I had to ask a friend or a fellow painter on feedback on what I had currently laid out on the canvas. Ironically, as I showed my friend the work, I realized that I was already knowing what I needed to do in this phase of the paintings. Now, after we finished chatting, everything started to flow again. I felt energized and excited as I remembered why I like painting. It feels like a puzzle, assembling all the different ideas and seeing how they fit together to bring a visual energy out from a blank surface. At this point, though, it's unlikely that I'll meet my self-created deadline. Now, the work is reminding myself that that's okay. We don't know what the winds are going to be like on the seas three days from now. We're just going to have to deal with them when we get there. The winds altogether stopped blowing for a few weeks on this project, but now they're gusty again, <laughs> to play out this metaphor, and I'm excited to ride the momentum. My focus these days, and my encouragement to you, is on imperfect action, on building an imperfect action plan that you can adjust in real time as needed. If I expect my actions to be imperfect and just do something, it takes the pressure off of getting it perfect the first time. Rather than the self-satisfaction of completing a task, this mindset allows me to be present with what I enjoy about the task at hand. But putting in the effort isn't the entire game, okay? There's a second gap that shows up for many of us, and that is the gap of skill. I know it can be hard to accept the fact that your skills may be lacking in certain areas. No one likes to feel inferior or not good enough. It's human nature. However, it's super important to be humble enough to acknowledge your shortcomings and work to strengthen and increase your skill sets in areas where you might be deficient. Of course, it can be hard to come to the realization that while your idea is super good and you're willing to put the effort in, the skills you have aren't good enough to deliver on it. Yikes, that's rough, right? At least for me to realize that. How about you? Is it a little rough to think about that being the case? The natural assumption is that the ability to have the idea is the harder part. And the idea is good, it assumes, that you have all of the required abilities to execute on it. It sucks, though, because we learn, once again, that assumption makes, well, you know what I'm talking about. For example, while I can imagine performing quadruple backflip dives and singing five octave melodies, 
that imagination, that idea has no bearing on my body's ability to do those things. I know what you're thinking. That's shocking, right? This, what I'm talking about now, is the skill gap. So basically, the skill gap is the distance between the skills required to execute your idea and the ones you actually have. Often, it's only through putting effort into a project that you'll discover where your gaps in skill lie. Now, take a second to think about where some of your skill gaps might be. Make a mental note or jot them down on a piece of paper so that you can remember them and think about them. These are the areas that you're going to want to focus on in order to push yourself toward being able to bring your vision to reality. So just think about that for a second. When you see the work of your heroes, I bet you don't even consider the fact that they once had gaps in their skill set too. It's easy to imagine that these rock stars were born with the abilities that we know them for. The problem here is that your view of other artists is backwards. You only come in contact with these people after they become famous and after they learned and perfected their craft. The works you know best are rarely an artist's early work, but rather those that we consider masterpieces. When you see a Georgia O'Keeffe painting in a museum or a Tolkien novel in a bookstore, you're looking at that artist's best work, likely created when they are or were in their prime. It's not too often that you get to see their many experiments, their uncertain output during the long years when they were developing the skills they became famous for. Some of my favorite exhibitions are the ones where usually tucked away in a little corner of the gallery somewhere, the sketchbooks or notebooks of the artists are presented. And this is a pretty rare opportunity for your thought process and exploration that the artist undertakes before they hit on a fantastically executed masterpiece. I know that many of you truly struggle with insecurity. One of the main reasons that you struggle with insecurity is because you compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. Now, come on, do I really need to scroll through the endless number of Instagram reels or TikTok posts to prove this point? I don't think so. It takes a lot of digging in the recesses of a person's studio to find their behind the scenes work. My favorite show on NPR is This American Life, and host Ira Glass says this, Nobody tells people who are beginners, and I really wish someone had told me, all of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste. There's a gap. For the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good. It's not that great. It's trying to be good. It has the ambition to be good, but it's not that good. He continues, but your taste, the thing that got you into the game, is still killer. And your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. A lot of people never get past this phase. They quit. And Ira Glass says, the thing that I would say to you with all of my heart is that most everybody I know who does interesting creative work, they went through a phase of years of this. Everybody goes through that. And most important possible thing that you can do is a lot of work. Do a huge volume of work, he says. It's only by actually going through that volume of work that you are actually going to catch up and close that gap. And the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. All right, that's Ira Glass. Back to me. Many talented people never develop their skill because they hate feeling the distance, and maybe you're one of them. You're embarrassed and tortured by it, maybe. Or perhaps you get so frustrated by what you can't do that you turn the paper over and walk away. On one hand, I can totally understand this. Who likes to feel lacking or not good enough? But on the other hand, I know that this approach is only a detriment to your growth as an artist. If you expect to improve 
at a pace. It really is wishful thinking. And when you fail to meet your expectations in this area, it's easy to fall apart. Sometimes you lack the commitment required to find out through practice exactly how much skill you may be capable of. It's always tempting to search for an easy and guaranteed path, despite the fact that no one exists, especially the heroes that we all look up to for inspiration. The tough news that Ira Glass suggests is that it's easier for our ambitions to grow as that happens only by consuming good works, than it is for our skills to improve, something that requires dedicated effort. One way that I've been able to encourage my clients to remain motivated, and maybe this will help you, in closing skill gaps is to study the history of masters that you admire. For example, the early works of Claude Monet, Jackson Pollock, are super, super different from the styles they became famous for. Brad Pitt's first acting role was in a chicken costume for a Mexican fast food restaurant, right? A little strange for Brad Pitt, but early on. And really, who knows how many awful plays young Shakespeare wrote that he burned in the trash heap. Honest biographies of nearly every famous musician, writer, entrepreneur will highlight in painful detail how they worked to close the skill gaps in their careers. Once you've got your skills locked in and ready to go, how you choose to use them becomes a matter of style. Style or quality gaps are the most subjective of all. So just hang in here with me for a second and, and bear with me. Unlike effort and skill gaps, a quality gap is a subjective opinion about the quality of what is made. When Picasso began working in his cubist style, or when he entered his blue period, it wasn't because of a lack of skill on his part. There was a specific quality, a feeling, a tone, an effect that he wanted to convey that he struggled to obtain. Depending on what idea you have in your mind, even if you work hard and have the right skills, you'll still experience quality gaps as you work through your projects. Some really famous creators struggled with their own opinion of their work, even after their public success. No matter how popular they became, they felt their work was flawed or not good enough, or maybe worst of all, never reaching the standards that they set for themselves. For example, one of my favorites, Bruce Springsteen, once called his Born to Run album the worst piece of garbage he'd ever heard, and he didn't want to release it. Artists are often victims of their own perceived quality gaps, and that probably applies to you too. At some point, if not already, you'll struggle to match the ideas in your mind to what you can manifest in the world. So here's some breaking news for you. Get ready, breaking news. Um, some very successful creators never close the quality gap, at least not on every project, and you likely won't either. That's the breaking news part. You likely won't either. And that is fine and perhaps even good. If you want to continue growing, you need to see it differently than when you started. Then in the very things you find lacking or wish you had done differently, you find the motivation for the next project and the one after that and the one after that. To be 100% satisfied with something you made likely means you didn't learn anything along the way. And personally, I'd rather be a little disappointed with projects now and then than experience the alternative of never learning anything at all. How about you? I think I can imagine you would be wanting to learn along the way. These three gaps, effort, skill, and quality will be constant companions throughout your journey of being an artist. And because of that, you have to grow some patience in how you deal with them. As an artist, maker, creator, doer, you are part of a challenging vocational calling where it takes time to develop your craft and that development, developmental process never ends. It's lifelong. The truth is that no one is coming to push you. No one is coming to tell you to turn off the TV, that you've chilled enough with Netflix, 
that you should get out the door and exercise or get to the museum and take in the beauty that is the work of other artists. Nobody tells you that it's your job to parent yourself. And by that, I mean, it's your job to make yourself do the crap you don't want to do. The tedious stuff that seems too hard at the outset, but makes all the difference in your outcome. You have to parent yourself into doing these things so that you can be everything you're supposed to be. It's pretty simple to get what you want, but that simplicity doesn't come easy. You're never going to feel like doing the things you need to do in order to have what you want. You're always going to need to push yourself. You're going to need to parent yourself. If you really believe in your ideas and potential, stay the course and commit to the long and only realistic path to fulfilling your ambitions. Being a lifelong learner is imperative to your ability to be sustained in this area of your life. Again, no one's going to push you. No one's going to tell you to turn the TV off. No one's coming to write the business plan or the grant application for you. It's up to you because you're the only one who's ever going to do the things that you feel like doing right now or that feel good right now. If you can take pleasure in making things for the sake of making them, do it. Take pleasure in it. If you feel love for your craft, honor it by showing up even when it's hard, especially when it's hard. Working when it's hardest often teaches rare lessons that will earn you easy rides every now and then. Take pleasure in these small amounts of progress when you experience it, and remember that those hard-won gains are the only way anyone in history has ever achieved anything noteworthy for themselves or the world. Now, what I'm about to tell you doesn't negate the fact that no one will push you to accomplish any of your goals or to close any one or all three of these gaps. But I do have a way that will help you grow in your creative life. So right now, at this very moment, I'm opening applications for the first cohort of my new program, the Grow Your Creative Life program. Still trying to figure out a better title. After so many years of working with artists and creatives, both in the therapy room as well as in coaching relationships, I know that this is something that will definitely benefit you. The Grow Your Creative Life program is an inspired artist community where you get over your shit, you envision your dreams, you develop innovative ways forward in your artistic and creative lives and journeys. And I know that you want to get unstuck. I just know it. You want to finally get past all the obstacles like these pesky creative gaps and self-sabotage that's been holding you back. Am I right? Even just a little bit, am I right about this? I know that over time you've become so good at hiding your creativity that even you sometimes have trouble finding your artistic genius. You've buried your talents for so long that sometimes you forget they exist, even though there's always this underlying hum of creative power revving just under the surface. I absolutely know that you are ready to smash your creative block and embrace your purpose and call yourself an artist. Find focus and joy in your art. Break through procrastination on demand. Kick imposter syndrome's ass to the curb and learn to trust yourself and your intuition. Really important intuition. I also know that you want to wake up every day with the ability to create with focus and purpose that you want to learn to value artistic talents and fully embrace your creative work. I know that you also want to make a living or at least some money doing what you love, creating your art, right? You want to naturally grow and expand in your creativity and self-expression. So how do I know all of this? Well, remember, you and I aren't that different. And you also chose to attend the summit to kickstart new growth in your creative and artistic self. And when you're in the middle of kickstarting your artistic self, you need lots of support along the way. Community. So because you and I are different breeds all together and the artist's heart is so strong in you, I developed this 
awesome opportunity for you and a few other people to grow this year. In this year-long group and self-paced program, you're going to begin to thrive in your creative life without the fear and insecurity that often comes with being an artist. I have curated a growth plan for you, my fellow artists, because I've learned over the course of my life what works to maximize creativity, and I really want to share it with you. My framework allows you to sow seeds of vision and passion deeply and allow them to germinate and take root so that your brain and your heart both sprout new creative life and grow to their fullest potential while you make the work that you feel confident about. And most importantly, you stop devaluing what you have to offer to the world. Now, here's the part where I'm going to remind you that you don't, that I'm not here to push you. This is not a formula where I tell you what to do and how to do it. Instead, this is a journey of embodying your true creative spirit and growing fully into your authentic work and purpose. So what are you waiting for? I bet a few of you are over at the website right now. It's time to take the next step of creative action towards your authentic artist self. Now, when you're over at the website, click on the apply now button and fill out the super, super short form so that I can connect with you and together you and I will get you started on the next step of your artistic journey. This, everybody, is your opportunity to get to work on closing your gaps. Take advantage of that opportunity. I'm serious. I'm so glad that you're here with me at the Grow Summit, and I cannot wait to see what comes out of this inspired artist community that you are helping to build. Thank you so much, and let's get to our next session. I am so glad that you're here, and I look forward to seeing what you do with your beautiful, wonderful, creative, artistic selves. Have a great afternoon, everyone.